Bullshit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, we had uh, Jared Moffat on, who uh, runs Regulate Rhode Island, with, with in conjunction with Normal, are the two biggest uh, spearheads, if you will, of attempts to continue to push the legalization issue. And, um, you know, we, we at our function here at our show on WPRO and on RI Free Radio, continue to ask young leaders like yourself to just completely dump on all these cliches, half-truths, urban legends, myths. It's it, because... There are these, all of the above exist for a single reason. You've got a group of folks who have yet to figure out how to monetize it for themselves and will not allow other people to engage in it, even if it's for, in the many of the cases, the very people in this building right now doing it for sheerly altruistic purposes to help other people's lives, to improve the quality of health care in America at a far more effective price point. Those are dangerous ideas in a quote unquote evolved, mature democracy like the United States where. You know, quite frankly, there's a whole lot of do re me at stake. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's really sad. It's really sad. There are... The government does know how to monetize this. They absolutely do. They hold the patent on cannabis as a neuroprotectant mm -hmm. to protect the brain against Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. They hold that patent. So they know. They know they could do it. They know they could have government-funded, government-sanctioned, government-organized, government-regulated grows and distribute cannabis to patients all over this country and they simply refuse. Obama could sit down at his desk, write a little note that says we legalize cannabis, stamp it and sign it, and that's that's it. It's done. Right. That's it. But right. he refuses for no apparent reason. We've got most of the country supporting full legalization. Mm -hmm. We've got medical patients everywhere. We've got flocks, droves of people flooding into Denver, Washington, or Colorado, Washington State, California, uh, Rhode Island, uh, Met, uh, Vermont, Maine, all of these states that have somewhat functioning, you know, system for medical cannabis. And, you know, these, these states where they have nothing, they're losing the people, their, their residents to other states. And right. nobody wants to do anything about it. Okay, so there's just even going to be less people in Kansas. How can there be less people in Kansas? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's people and then there's functioning people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, um, oh, not everybody's uh, terrible in Kansas. Uh, uh, they have tornadoes, hey, though. I wouldn't how about, go the, there. How, about, how about those Red Sox? <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, we, what's astonishing, too, is if you look at the, consume, the infrastructure that exists to support, legalize, protect the community uh, with alcohol, why that can't be, you know, replicated in a hard... We, we, we see it on so many different levels. We see it, number one, as a public safety issue, um, you know, whereas you've got people across New England dying using synthetic forms mm -hmm. of, of quote-unquote... And actually, I, I was called to task for this yesterday, so I won't do it again. I will no longer use the word synthetic. I will use invented medicines or invented abusive... I, we'll, come up, we'll come up with a replacement for synthetic marijuana. Why, why don't <laughs> we like... Saying well, synthetic marijuana. Because ultimately... Because it's not marijuana? It's not marijuana okay. at all. It's gotcha. a bastardization Makes of some sense. chemical process, which is completely undocumented. That's killing people. Yes, yes. So because it's not, they're yes. being led all to right. believe that it's marijuana. Okay, right. and, I'm following. You know, and it, <laughs> but it, but the, the, the point is that it's a, there's a public health crisis in this region in particular because uh -huh. of the effects of, 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 heroin. of, of heroin, crystal meth. Yep. I mean, go across the state of Massachusetts and central, central New England where it is not the shiny beacon on the hill that is Boston no. or even less so in Providence. You know, you've got uh, the cost associated with an out-of-control uh, prison system and a, a legal industrial complex that is actively looking to recruit people into their prisons as yep. opposed to prevent people. We've got people suffering from the pains of addiction of any one of the number of opioids that are being inflicted on them by the yep. medical community in this country. On and on and on. The political implications and ramifications of having our Central American neighbors be run over by narco-terrorists mm -hmm. because of the, of the completely predictable effects evidenced in the 1920s by prohibition of alcohol on prohibiting ordinary, everyday self-medication. I mean, all of this is so effing predictable and, and in the, in the consequences are so clear mm -hmm. that you have to wonder if any, if, if any of these people are awake or are they such hardened cynics dedicated to the stream of campaign contribution that comes yes. from big pharma That's and, it. and, and That's big, it. big retail it's that money. they are simply unwilling 
that they are, their souls are so corrupted that they are unwilling to do anything for any one of the patients that are in this, in this room right now today. Yes, that is exactly correct. Okay. It is the money. <laughs> it is the money. Yeah. They, the people who will make money on cannabis now are the entrepreneurs who believe in the plant. The people who are going to make money on cannabis in 10 years are the people who already have money and are making more money. Right. And then the, in, and then in that time there will be a switch in that however long it takes you know once the rich people are making more money then you, you you're going to be in that phase where they'll be willing to put donations into campaigns and this and that and the other but they're trading they're trading money for favors and right. favors for money right. and it goes back and forth in between these wealthy to do businesses and these politicians who need money for their campaigns uh, without you know Pfizer we, there's a lot of things we wouldn't have. We, there's Pfizer's not a great company. I try to avoid pharmaceuticals, but there are a lot of things that they create that people really need. I'm a middle-aged guy. You don't have to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, you, once once we're past that, and the politicians are able to say, you know, okay, so. 60, 70, 80 percent of my constituents support marijuana, and there's this company that is, you know, profiting in the millions, and they can contribute to my right. to my uh, campaign. Then that's when marijuana gets to trade with the favors and the money. Right. No. <laughs> but it's it's all going to get there. It's not like anything stays out of that unless we stop campaign contributions. It's only a matter of time before marijuana money is trading. Right. But hopefully we're asking for favors that are better for the environment and the community and society than the favors that other companies might be asking for, so, like so, the banks and the pharmaceuticals. Right. So someday we could actually, though, maybe consider, maybe just once a year, let's do something because it's the right thing to do? Yeah. Just once. I, I can see it happening at some point in the future. I right. can see it happening. So, <laughs> so, so what, I mean, in terms of cultural cliches and bias, how, how much of that is a daily challenge for your business? Oh, I get uh, the opposite. I get the, you smoke weed? You, you don't look like you smoke <laughs> weed. You don't, you don't look like a stoner. Are your dreads under your hair? Are you wearing a wig? Where's your hippie skirt? No. I wear, you know, blazers or cardigans and sandals and heels. And, you know, I, I don't have the stereotypical look. I right. don't. I, it's. I'm not comfortable like that, so that's not me. Right. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it. I love the hippies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no denying it. I love them. Uh, I just don't look like them. And I think that it's important that more people who don't look the role are stepping out into the light. You of mean kind of like middle-aged white guys? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, um, I mean established, well-educated black men. I mean mothers. I mean uh, business owners. I mean um, representatives. I mean governors. I mean these people who you look at and you go, oh, they got, they don't smoke weed. And yes, they do. Yes, they do. They go home every night or every Saturday or whenever they have a headache or whenever their foot hurts, and they use cannabis. And they're going to BS you. They are going to BS you, but they probably do. I remember years ago, I'll, I'll tell you the Reader's Digest version of the story. Um, I used to work in Manhattan. I was on Park Avenue, and I had two tickets, back-to-back -back nights, Madison Square Garden, The Grateful Dead. Nice. And the, uh, I waited, the first night, I waited until after the show, uh, sorry, after work, I waited about an hour, made sure everyone had gone home, tiptoed into the, uh, the men's room, changed into concert-appropriate attire. Went down to Park Avenue and proceeded to wait an hour and a half until I realized that there was no taxi on Park Avenue that would ever pick me up. So the second night... I'm a smart guy. The second night, put my stuff into a backpack, actually into a briefcase, go down to Madison Square Garden behind Penn Station. Now, imagine this. I'm wearing literally a Brooks Brothers suit. I used to be, Beautiful. I, I was a yuppie. I, I, I missed that time. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I, I sneak into the back. Please, you're still wearing a baby blue polo. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, that's right. What do you miss? <laughs> so I sneak into, into, into Penn Station because if anyone, my friend, saw me, I'd never hear the end of it. So slowly I, tip, I think of the, think of John Belushi in the, in the, in the, uh, in the Animal House, tiptoeing, right? <laughs> being a stealthy kind of guy. I sneak into the men's room, which is this huge, probably as big as this hall, and underneath Penn Station, and, and to, to change it to concert appropriate attire. And all of a sudden I looked up, and there were a couple of thousand men in business suits changing into tie-dye, <laughs> which, uh, which says, we are everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> we, we are still the guys who go into the middle of a party and take off the record and put on the Grateful Dead album. Yes. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I know very few people who say absolutely no. I, I mean, I know some. And they lie. I know some people who say, no, I know a, a woman who's in her uh, 80s who has cancer and refuses. She says, no, drugs are bad, okay? No, she won't touch it. I keep saying, please just try it. Please use a cream. You don't have to smoke it. Try a brownie. You'll feel better. She won't do it. I know people who say, uh, who, prominent people, people on TV, people that you would know that by name, and, you, and they say, no, drugs are bad. Marijuana is bad. It's the gateway. But if you're having a private conversation with these people, of course, I would vote for it. Absolutely. I'm just not going to hurt my reputation. I'm not going to risk my chances of the next election. I'm not going to risk my job. I'm not going to have somebody that knows me see me at a pot convention. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, if they're at the pot convention and they <laughs> see you at the pot convention, Odds they are. also like pot. <laughs> so, that could be your little dirty secret together. <laughs> but they won't. You know, they're scared. There's a lot of people who are scared. And that's that's the, the worst part about it. People need to not be afraid. Because especially in Massachusetts, I mean, you could be, your car can reek of pot. As long as the police officer cannot see pot, right. they can't do anything so, at all and i finally took that bumper sticker off warning i break for hallucinations <laughs> on the back of the car um so your your program then it's how many it's a four hour classes four hour classes there's 12 classes mm -hmm. and then there's a two hour exam so it's a total of 50 hours that you're out on campus oh. and then there's seminars there's women's group there's patient support group there's um Resume writing that is exclusive to alumni and completely free. Um, and we have, uh, we had a media seminars coming up. We have a, we had a extracts and concentrate seminar. We had a propagation and cloning seminar. So, you know, it, we work every weekend's crazy busy. So it's like Monday through Friday. And then there's stuff on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> Do you have a football team yet? No. <laughs> no, not yet. Not we, yet. We need, uh, we were thinking a Quidditch team. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> that, Although that. stoners running around between sticks between their legs might be unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Um, <laughs> the, um, so it, it's, so if, if you're looking to work at a compassion center, mm -hmm. you're really one of the primary sources to go to so that you can really address yeah. all the issues on a professional level. Yeah. The, the two biggest things are knowing the regulations and not accidentally getting your company shut down. Mm -hmm. That's a big one because then you're not just losing your job, you're getting, you know, you're having a bunch of people lose their jobs. Right. And then uh, the second most important thing is patient education. Uh, so if you're working at a dispensary and you're on patient, in the patient-facing side of a compassion center or RMD in Massachusetts or whatever it is, whatever you call it in your state, um, then... You, you need to be able to teach patients coming in what titration is, how to moderate their dosage, what different methods of application do for different aspects, how it works within the body, what the endocannabinoid system is. You have to be able to teach them all these things. If you just really like pot and you're super interested and you just can't wait to give pot away to the patients and like sell pot. And grandma works out with a 200, walks out of the dispensary with a 250 milligram brownie because she has Parkinson's and go home and eat the whole thing because nobody told her not to. Right. She will never use cannabis again. Right. She will be terrified. It will not be a good experience and she will not come back. And that is A, not helping the patient, not helping with their medical issues, and B, not building a clientele for your company. Because patients, customers, whatever you want to call them, it's a clientele. You need to build relationships with people. You need them to be coming back. You need to be a profitable business. Or a nonprofit still needs to have money coming in so that they don't go under. Mm -hmm. 
In terms of your funding, I mean, it, this is this is you're considered this an entrepreneurial exercise. Yeah. You're completely self-funded. We have a yeah, we have a we have a wonderful couple of benefactors who are, are just really invested in the education of cannabis and mm -hmm. are uh, taking care of the school, making sure we are up and running and we have what we need. And you know, we have we have over 200 students, so you know, we're not we're we're chugging along. Now, on a political side, how?